Hey, Latinos in clinical research. Thank you for joining us. Welcome back. We've got Marlene Moody. She's manager regional feasibility network. So for Par Excel, major zero feasibility. Marlene's in a unique situation because she's got two stakeholders really interested in what she does. She's got, you know, the career seekers. I mean, they think it might be interesting because it's not CRA. It's not remote site monitor. It's not coordinator. It's something a little bit like exotic feasibility. I feel like it's a little bit exotic. And and <laughs> then you've got the sites because Chris, people like Chris Sauber, I've never been more excited about never. any of our guests than <laughs> Ever. <you>. No. <laughs> never, Chris. Actually, uh, um, yeah. I was confirming. Never, ever. He's so excited he turned off his camera because like he's just can't contain himself. <laughs> so you've got a lot of people interested in this and you know feasibility from both a career perspective and from sites trying to get studies perspective. Um, there's a lot we can discuss. Marlene is a Latinos in clinical research regular. She's a member. And she is a somebody everybody needs to get to know and network with. So her LinkedIn's underneath this video. And if you're listening on the show notes in the podcast. So thank you, Marlene, for coming back. Thank you for having me again. I was saying earlier, I feel like I'm part of the family. Now. You are. You are. Uh, what's new in feasibility world? Like, I don't know. I feel like I say this every time, but like I've it's never been busier on my end. I keep saying that one of these months I'm gonna say, okay, well, it's slightly less busy. <laughs> but so it's far, no. no. All right, no, very... <laughs> super busy because everybody wants to get everything in before the end of the year. So for me, like I'm just like, er, like I'm I may have shed like a little tear this week of all the stress. <laughs> Maybe I did. It's just super, super busy. So on, on our side, there's just a lot coming in, um, you know, new studies coming in. And it's just, you know, everything is right before the end of the year. So we're, we're in November, right? So we don't have much left for 2022, which is crazy. It's like it's already going to be 2023. So there's a lot of movement and therefore also for the site side, right? So yeah, I've been well, seeing a lot of rescue studies. Like, <clears throat> my site's been a beneficiary of that. Like, hey, you McClanko Trials, you guys, we know it's the holidays. Can you guys start screening before Christmas and our, our site selection visits today? <laughs> We're like, okay. <laughs> if so, you can get us the study. So that's we'll super busy. <laughs> that's so Marlene, if I could ask you a question about that specific topic, the holidays. When yeah. When do sponsors stop awarding studies? Is it a week prior to Thanksgiving, after Thanksgiving? No, they 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 keep going because they, they they normally reach out to us year round, right? So sometimes they just get, you know, you we're we're you know for for feasibilities or for questionnaires in general, you know, there's different types, right? So there's kind of like the pre award side, we're still trying to do like bid defenses, right? And then standalones and also like the prequels. So for that, like we could get them all the way to the end at least on our side, we're not going to stop saying, yes, we're going to get it now or, or wait until the beginning of the year. Because, you know, if we have them secured for 20, you know, for this year, it's still good for us, even if we're not technically enrolling right until the following year, but at least they're like on the books per se. So I don't think there's like an actual time, like you would be like, oh, before Thanksgiving, because, you know, a lot of these sponsors are not only based in the U.S., right? For us, the U.S., it's like, okay, it's Thanksgiving now. So for like my U.S. sites, it's going to be slower to get responses, for example. But for other countries, we have some, you know, that are based in Asia, for example, or APAC, right? So those are going to keep going. So I wouldn't say, I wouldn't put a, a point that's saying, okay, it's stopping right at this point or right before Thanksgiving or so forth. So between Thanksgiving and Christmas, you've seen studies awarded to sites. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. <laughs> Marlene, we already have a question from somebody. Okay. Uh, Molina, he's asking, can someone define feasibility in the context of clinical research? Define feasibility? 
So feasibility for me is kind of like the ground of everything. Obviously, I'm in feasibility. So I, I mean, since I've worked in research and the CRO level, I've worked always in site identification and feasibility. But feasibility, if you, you know, if you, if you get the word, is something that's feasible, something that's convenient, right? Something that's actually going to be easy to get done. So that's kind of like the word of it. But some people call it feasibility. Some of their CROs call it site identification. It's basically the base of getting a study started or up and running. So what we really do is just look for sites. That's why I know Dan's kind of saying, okay, sites are like super interested in this because our main thing is getting the right sites at the right time for the right trial in a way. So in the context of clinical research, when a study is going to be up and running or starting, it all starts, well, before, you know, we get the trial at the CRO level, it's like it's be for us. Um, after the study is awarded, then you know, we're just trying to get the right site. So we try to do the best from the beginning because then we have those issues like what Dan said, okay, we have a rescue study because the study just did not work out well from the beginning. So they have to go back to that same thing. And we don't like that. <laughs> That's just extra work going back. And sometimes in our case, for example, in my department, let's just say a study is going to reopen, it's going to be a rescue study. I try to get the same person to work on it again because they're already like acquainted with the protocol per se and that not always that doesn't always work so it's always hard for me to like juggle around and be like oh I appointed this study to this one you know liaison in my case that's how we're called and there's a new rescue study who worked on this two years ago or who worked on this six months ago and they have to go back so we try not to get to that point um so obviously if we have like a very solid um site list at the beginning or site selection at the beginning, we hopefully jump that hurdle. Um, so I don't know if that kind of answers your question, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I was going to keep going. I'm like, wait, I need to stop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Marlene. Another question we had is, for example, for a new site, uh, they are sending an email. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse. Uh, so they are they are trying to get new studies uh, for the site and all of this. And obviously, the beginning of this is uh, reaching out to the sponsor. Um, when they send the email, the initial email, the expression of interest, or is there is something that the sponsor wants to see in that email in particular that will um, raise the attention because oftentimes you send emails and emails and no one answers. So are you, are, so there's two parts, right? And I'm just going to be as honest as I can, especially for me. I've found sites that they just randomly, right? If, if I work for Paracel, it's pretty obvious probably what my email would be, right? So they kind of look for people on LinkedIn and then they just start blasting out emails to everybody and their mother and the company. And that really is aggravating in my case. Because it's like, okay, so in my case, like my team, I've had sites that have sent the same email to at least five other colleagues. And I'm like, and then they send it to me and I'm like, okay, we already know that they're interested in participating in a trial, right? So there's two sides. There's that side where we find sites that literally just blast out emails. They just figure out the email address of, you know, someone in that company and they kind of like draft something out and then they let us know, right? And then there's other sites where if you are actually invited to a to participate in a clinical trial, that's like a different type of email. If we're responding to that email, really the best thing for you to do is to respond as quickly as you can with your responses, if it's a CDA or if it's a feasibility questionnaire, because all that gets tracked. So we get that part gets tracked. And also when it switches from feasibility to like study startup, obviously how good your performance is and how quickly you actually you know, screening the first patient or, or, you know, randomizing the first patient, all of that gets tracked in our systems. So I, for me, it's always like, just be as efficient as you can um, and let us know yes or no. Like, that's my biggest thing is like, especially for the U.S., our lists are normally long because there's just so many sites in the U.S., right? Um, and the hardest thing for us is reaching out to a site and sending them emails or calling them five times, six times, seven times, I'm hearing nothing. And it's just like cricket. So we have like both sides of like sites that are like super like direct, they're super quick, they answer and we're like, yay, that's what I want. And then we have other sites that 
just take forever and all that gets tracked. So that's just like my, like a tip for me to, to say out to these sites. Now it's not so much of what you're going to say, but it's just really like how quickly you're going to like. Respond. Okay. So those are for the ones that get invited because they already probably have experience or did a study in the past with the, with the sponsor. But how about for those that are brand new ones? that don't have any record with the sponsor and, want, and and have the information for that new study and want to reach out. I mean, and they have the information for the person and they have the information about the study and they are truly interested in being part of the study. So we normally, I mean, and, and obviously it, it you know, it's different from zero to zero. I've worked in multiple, but some of the times we do have like a line where we say, you know, to like one specific investigator, do you have anybody that you want to like refer, right? So I think you've probably have seen that there's like that line item where we're like in the questionnaires, like, do you want to refer someone else? Do you want to refer a colleague? So I, I would actually, if there's someone else that they know, you know, because I know kind of, this study. <laughs> kind of sends out, it shouldn't, but you know, it kind of like, you know, the diversity moves out and like the word comes out. Um, you know, that's something, that's an avenue to do. The other thing is the majority of CROs have like on their webpage, a way for an investigator to like send like a question. I know like at least for our CRO there and the one that I worked for before, you know, there's a, a specific part in the website where like it's, really for like investigators or for principal investigators or for sites so they could actually go in and there's like a comment box too so there's something that you could actually get in and like send that information in there so we normally have someone appointed to review all those you know kind of like inquiries that come through so that's something else that I think would be a good way of doing it if you do know the person that reached out to another investigator per se you can still try and send that email out. What what to us is just really rough is when you send it to like five people in the team because it's like, okay, yeah, of course. It, you know, that's not going to make it any better. I'm not even going to look. I mean, I'm actually going to be like, no, be, like, why are you sending it to five? You know, like, I don't know. I just think it's 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 rough when you literally get the same email so many times. But I think that would be good. Just send it out to like the main page of that particular CRO. And if you have one contact, it's you could still give, a, give it a shot, right? Um, but also the other thing is like obviously networking. I have been on, on, you know, speaking with you guys and I've gotten some people message me through LinkedIn, you know, and actually tell me, hey, da -da. so it's good to at least double check and see if they're even in our, in our database. If they're not in our database and I'll tell them, just, you know, send me the information. I'll make sure at least your information gets place into the database because if you're not there there's no way for me to search it right so um yeah those are oh right. that's very interesting to know thank you yeah. and okay so this is a question a little bit more personal how did you end up doing feasibility like is something like Dan was saying is is such an exotic um path or career path we we don't hear all the time your position or where you're doing what you're doing right now how did you end up there so my my path for, for research and i think i kind of probably spoke about it before but i, I don't think everybody was here so i'll, I'll just give kind of like a little summary of how i got into research so i'm i was originally born in belize in central america i went to the majority of my life, I lived in Panama, but then went to Costa Rica and I studied physical therapy. So I'm a physical therapist in Costa Rica. That's what my that's what I went to college for. When I came here to the U.S., I kind of worked in like the medical field and I started working in clinical research and um, patient recruitment, which I think is the same thing that we, we spoke that's that me. we have that in common. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I started working in, in patient recruitment, but because I had experience with like patients, because I was a physical therapist, I was able to go into the clinic and actually start working with the patients because I was missing that patient interaction. Um, so one thing that I used to do also this after being in the clinic, I was a clinical research but a coordinator, but one thing that I did the most was I was a pre-screener. So in a lot of these sites, and I recommend that really, really highly. If there's anybody here at the site level, I think everybody should have pre-screeners because it's just, that was one of my favorite positions, if I'm honest, when I was in, in at the site level. Um, so as a pre-screener, so you actually had to be able to 
kind of do the same thing, but at the other side of the coin, right? <clears throat> so that was probably part of my, in my CV. Um, and I got into site ID, literally, I was the one calling the sites. That was my first position in a CRO, just literally calling the sites and trying to see if they wanted to be in different clinical trials. So almost the same thing as I was doing as a pre-screener, but more pre-screening sites now in another way. And that just trickled in till now, yeah, you know, being able to lead the ones that are actually calling the sites. Um, and it's my favorite job now at the CRO level, if I have to say. Um, I, I enjoy a lot just, you know, having this group of amazing people that just, you know, work trying to get the best, you know, sites in for us. So that's kind of how it went through. And I think it's good for us to see outside the box. I know that's one of the things that we're also trying to to encourage, you know, not to think of, okay, only CRC, only CRA. There's still yeah. much in between. There's literally like a huge exactly. line of jobs in between. Um, so I, I know I kind of said that before in another one of my, you know, the other podcasts is like going to, if you're going to go and, you know, look at these different jobs, you read the job descriptions, you know, like, I think that's like a huge thing, like, and check and see if that's something that would actually work for you. Because sometimes you don't have to go just the CRA route, right? Like traveling is not for everyone either. You know, it's not, it doesn't work for everybody for every style of life, but something like this, you're at home, you know? So it's definitely super flexible and you still have that exposure and you still have that way of actually growing into the, the, you know, into the, the CRO role per se, right? Because you're starting at one point, but you get this just exposure to being able to like maybe move into like business development if that's something that you would like to do or move into like the pre-award space. That's something that's really popular too. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's what I always tell the students that research wall is not a straight, a straight line. It's just like so many options and opportunities. It's like whatever you can think of any career that is outside in different industries, we more likely have it in research. Yeah. Uh, and then the pharmaceutical world. And I think they have to take advantage of their Spanish too, right? Or like, just because we're talking about Latinos in clinical, that's why I'm kind of saying that. Obviously I speak Spanish, so I'm the feasibility manager for the Americas. So I'm in charge also of like South America, Central America. So I think you have to try to like get that power out of you and be like, hey, I speak Spanish, you know, this is going to actually work and do, you know, because it helps. Like for me, it does help because I actually speak the language. So if I have to reach out to, you know, some, I mean, Portuguese, I can't do that well, but you could understand a little bit, right? <laughs> uh, Marlene, I actually had a question about Latin America, um, yeah, sure. particularly Mexico. So I have a colleague in, he's in Tijuana, right outside Baja California, or right in Baja California, right outside of San Diego, but on the Mexico side. Mm -hmm. And we were going back and forth about when sponsors use sites in Mexico. Um, and we weren't entirely clear on that because I know the FDA has a list of countries where they will accept study data from, like they mm -hmm. consider it equivalent to the U S mm -hmm. do you happen to know anything about this? And like in the case of Mexico, right. Or maybe just any country in Latin America, when do sponsors decide we're going to, we're going to run this this uh, study not only in the U.S. but also in Latin America because it doesn't happen all the time. It doesn't, and I really do think it depends. That's more of, and I think someone asked about like what was pre-award space. So this is more in the pre-award part. So to to answer a question, and then I'll kind of move on to like the the Mexico side for feasibility or for site identification. We have like pre-award and post-award. So pre-award is prior a study getting awarded or prior a study actually being given to us. And then post-award is after we actually have the study, like the sponsor said, the study is given to you, we're moving forward with you. That's kind of like the post-award. So pre-award is more like a faster pace. So there's obviously, you know, all these sponsors coming to us and saying, I have this, 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 and that. Let's see if we'll give the study to you. So there's a lot of like, digging and that's where more of like the study mix of the country like the country mix you would call it is normally presented um so i'm not strong in pre-award side but normally what we what like the pre-award team they have different models where they actually pull depending on the indication and they look and see okay so for this indication it's more prevalent in this country in this country in that country so we think that we could probably go to mexico for this one we 
probably think we could go to, you know, Brazil for this other one. So then we normally bring that team normally brings that information over to the sponsor. And then they're like, we agree or disagree for to that. Um, and then sometimes like I was talking about, there's different surveys. So there's kind of like pre-award surveys too, where even though the study is not awarded to us, we kind of still reach out to certain like key opinion leaders to kind of be like, hey, do you think this is a good study? Do you think this sounds that could be correct? Do you think this could you know, work in your country, for example? So and like for your friend who you're saying that's in Mexico, he would be like a good one to be like, okay, we have a new diabetes study. Do you think it would be feasible in Mexico for it to be, you know, so we normally ask like very general questions and then we could bring that back to the sponsor and say, hey, we believe this and this and this could happen. I think the, the biggest setback on using countries in Latin America is just how slow process is over there. You know, a lot of like the regulatory part is like normally takes longer <laughs> than for the US or like for, you know, certain countries in, in the UK. So in the UK, in the, in the EU. So I think that's sometimes what hurts it in, in a way, if I'm, if I'm being honest. So I think certain sites that have everything like more centrally would actually help. So that's like more attractive, right? So if I could say like, I have this one site that actually could do all the paperwork faster because we have like these timelines and you could actually show, yes, we can provide and we could get up and running in a certain time. It's normally more appealing, um, but that is, you know, that's why you don't see it like for every single trial. And then certain trials, the sponsor just want them to be in the U.S. per se, um, and it's not like a global trial. So we have global trials, and then we have just studies that are, you know, located only like in North America. Yeah, like what percentage of the studies that you source? I guess that's I don't know what the right term for it would be, but um, overlap between Latin America and U.S. versus just U.S. I couldn't tell you a percentage, but if I want to tell you in terms of headcount, right? So my team, it's 15 of us and there's only two in Latin America and the rest are of the US and North America. So just okay. that would give you an idea of really what it, what it is. We do have a couple um, SFLs, that's how we call them in my, in my team that speak Spanish. So sometimes they will cross and they'll help even though they're in the US, they'll still help um, for Latin America, but they're not technically destined or they're not technically linked to work for let you know for let them yeah. so if you look at it the percentage is a lot less and that's one of the things that i wish could change so sometimes each time i see like a new country from latin america i'm always like excited for example i'm from panama you know i, I live there majority of the time so i have this one study where panama is in the mix and i'm just like yay <laughs> <I'm> like <laughs> jumping when i see that country because i'm like that's not very common to see panama at all um but i i think you know, it's all with education too for the sponsor and be like, hey, you know, I think this country in particular has a high population with X or Y and Z, um, you know, medical condition. I think we should be able to utilize them, right? Um, but yeah, it's definitely lower, a lot lower. Every yeah. single one has the US, that's for sure. Two out of 15, so it's like two and 15, so it's like 85 15 uh percent it's kind of what i've been seeing too mm -hmm. across the studies we get that's yeah. very interesting to know <laughs> because uh recent i mean with the true latinos in clinical research we have been getting um reach out from uh, sites and clinics uh from latin america so that's something that we can maybe work together with the sponsors when uh, you guys need um, specific areas, we can always work it out and help collaborate with that. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's a lot of awareness too, right? Just kind of be like, and my biggest thing is if we just take like a small population or a small amount of countries, and I think I've mentioned this before, is like, you know, it, it the mechanism of action is just different. So it's different probably, even though we're all Latinos in a way, it's different how it's going to work for someone that lives in Panama versus someone that mm -hmm. lives in Brazil versus exactly. someone that lives in another country. Exactly. So when you take that medication, it's like, oh, it worked for you. Well, it's not working for me, but maybe because it never got even, you know, tested. That's so it. that yeah. <laughs> so it's, That's it's, exactly it's, right. You know. 
Okay, so I have another question uh, from somebody uh, that sent it via text. So this is a brand new site, okay? And they are wondering what's the amount of experience the sponsor is looking for in the principal investigators, uh, taking into account that this this these investigators are already doctors and they basically are not gonna do something so different than what they do already that is taking care of patients. Yeah, and I really think it depends on the indication, to be honest, because now like studies are more and more complicated like if you if I mean I know Dan has like a site you know like you see these things and these protocols and these like they're just so much more in detail so I think sometimes they're kind of like okay if it's something a lot easier like an indication that's a lot easier it's normally you have like a better chance I would say to be to be selector to be in a trial if we have like a germ study you know something that's just like a topical cream something like that like that there's not that much in that right but like if you have if you go to like oncology trials those are like a beast or if you go to like early phase trials right like where you have to have like phase one units and in stays like those are completely different so I think it really depends on the indication that would be one thing for me the other thing I uh that's just personal thinking I think it would be nice to have like a balance so if the principal investigator doesn't have as much experience have like a coordinator that has more experience uh, right yeah so <clears throat> because yeah at least you could have like because when you're going to send information through sometimes like the questionnaires will ask you how long has the investigator been you know working on this or you know on as in research but then sometimes it will ask you also about the coordinator or like the other staff that's with you so if you have like kind of like that balance i think sometimes it might work um that's just kind of like a more ideal situation for you to kind of like try to keep going through or like if you are a new investigator try to have something like what's what's going to make you different or what's going to Que te va a destacar. I'm trying to say that word in Spanish, in English now. Like, oh my like, Lord. Uh, what is what is your 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 competitive advantage yeah, over like, everybody else? What's just gonna make you you? Like, what makes Marlene Marlene? <laughs> make you stand out. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, what's Naomi. Gonna make you stand out? <laughs> like, what's gonna make you you? Right. So it's like, because sometimes like you have, and this is completely off like research, but sometimes maybe there's three people that are selling the same product, right? But what is going to make you stand out versus the other? So I think that's something else that that you could like bring to the table and somehow, and a lot of these questionnaires have comment boxes. So like utilize your comment box because we're going to read it. Like it's going to be pulled in that report. So I think you kind of like need to sell yourself in a way, especially if you're newer. Um, so I, I would say if you have something specific that like makes you unique, okay, I'm diverse, definitely like my population, like I, I, you know, I'm in the middle of nowhere where I know like the people that I see would make your study, you know, be more diverse, just an example, like, or, or my, or my whole team is bilingual. <laughs> <laughs> because that's something, especially now, right? Like this is like a big thing. Everybody wants that. So like point it out and just try to, and I know it's hard. Every beginning is hard. But after you, you know, you start getting seen and after you are part of the system, you'll keep coming up. So that's why I'm trying to that's why I said that at the beginning, if you're a new site or whoever or, or your experience site, um, just make sure that you, you know, get things done quickly. Right. So it's like that's why again it's feasibility so it's like what's convenient to your site like what's a good to your site i think sometimes the error that we can you make is we want to be in a study so bad but this study was just not good for my site so i still said oh yeah i'll take it and then at the end you just have like very poor on um, performance and that is going to make it bad because literally all these numbers stay in our systems so um you're going to be able to historically see what happened in that one particular trial and there's no comment box there right so there's nothing there where it's going to be like oh well what happened was this this happened and that happened we're not going to see that we're just going to see the numbers when was the study started when did it get up and running when was the first time that they enrolled a patient when was the first you know when did it finish did they meet their numbers so um hopefully that's a little bit of a help there that's a that's a great those all those little tips are so important it's so important especially i mean for everybody for for sites that have experience and for new sites because sometimes like 
even even I mean us with the sites uh sometimes we leave that space the comment space empty and now that you're mentioning that you can you can tell so much in that part um I think the feasibility is like when you're passing uh CVs looking for a job <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're you're kind of have to take I mean work it out well answer right the questions and and obviously uh, that that make you stand out is is the is is a key factor for sites because obviously uh, there are many sites competing for uh, for each study even though that right now there are so many studies I don't know if there are more studies for than sites or more sites than studies. <laughs> We're probably uh, almost the same. We're probably wiped out in a way. What I'm looking for is for early phase study, early phase um, sites that that I don't have. That's like I'm lacking that. So if you know those, come my way. Send me messages. <laughs> uh, Marlene, I had a question. So I'm um, I've been quiet because I'm not really on the site perspective. That's more like Dan, Monica's, and Judy's, you know, thing. But um, I was curious. So um, you mentioned in the comment box, right? You can add these extra things that you would think make your site stand out. So would you say that if your site, one, like you had mentioned, everybody's bilingual, would it also matter if your site took a particular like diversity training, right? Everybody mm -hmm. on, on the site staff, or would it would it help to know that your site is also part of maybe like a, a diverse recruitment um, system or things like that in regards to the access to patients that they have? I mean, all those kinds of things, does that stuff also help kind of uh, accentuate your how much you stand out it does and i think there was also a message that came through of kind of like when you're when you have competing trial or competing i don't know if you were talking about like competing sites maybe but the way how it works like we we're going to send these feasibilities out right so we're going to get all these responses and we're going to call like, all the responses and we're going to put everything literally side to side so a lot of a lot of CROs have like point systems when they like rate your site you know when you finish so literally sometimes when they're like let's say you need 10 sites and then your site was probably site number 11 from that list but maybe another site said no I don't want to be in the study anymore then you're going to go back to that and be like oh I remember site you know Ashley's site they actually mentioned that they actually had this this and that so you know like those things you're going to read them, you're going to remember, right? Because it, it's in there. But if you never said it, we're not going to know. Because if we didn't even think about reaching out to you, you never had a QV, you never had an SIV. So we didn't even talk to your site. But if you actually wrote it down, there's like a bigger possibility, you know? So I think obviously some some studies have like a character limitation on like your comments probably, but you should just kind of be like wise and like, what am I going to put in there? Um, mm -hmm. That's going to literally, again, catch my attention or catch whoever's attention to be able to like pass it on to um you know to the sponsor because right now we're kind of like the middleman right so for me I'm like the middleman between the sponsor and the clinic or you know or the site or the investigator so I'm not the one that reviews those the, the questionnaires I used to do that that was my 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 previous job before I took this management position so I used to be the one that actually reviewed the 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 surveys like the responses um and we normally discuss it between us first before presenting it to the sponsor right because we want to present them like the top sites so that's why i think it's just so important to say everything and be truthful that's my biggest thing too because again like i'm saying that information stays so if you if i literally picked you know your site and at the end you said i'm gonna enroll 50 patients and then you only do 10 it's like okay well they did not do what they said they were gonna do um so i think that's another thing is just trying to be as truthful as you can and i know sometimes it's hard to like be very specific and you could be off by a couple numbers that's 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 normal <clears throat> but i think that's just you know put in the information that you want to that you need to put in and just you know be as truthful and as quick as you can to answer and if you really don't want to do the trial let us know please let us know <laughs> <laughs> we do them all marlene um yeah. i like how you broke that down because i think a lot of people not just people who work in the industry but sites especially they don't realize how big these cro's are um so you were just saying I don't actually review the feasibilities. That's something I used to do. Now I manage before we present. So can you just give us like a breakdown? Who reviews it? What's the process like? 
how do you guys decide who you present to the sponsor and what does that look like? Yeah, and it really and, depends and, again. Sorry, yeah, sorry. can ahead. you include in that also how do you determine the questions? How do you what? Determine the questions that are gonna be oh, part determine of one question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean in our organization, I mean, again, I've, I've worked in different, depends how big they are, that's, you're more like departmentalized, right? Same thing with the site, how big, the bigger the site, the less things you have to do, because, you know, they just have someone that does everything, right? So like, you do this, you do this, you do this, like, when it's a smaller site, you do everything. Um, so I, it, I was a feasibility lead. So in, 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 at least at Paracel, like we have a feasibility lead. That's the person that normally sits down and actually writes down the survey questions, like what you were saying, Monica. This is something that's done in collaboration with the sponsor. So normally the feasibility lead, they have different names in every single company because they, you know, we're just like that. We just try to make it complicated for everyone. Um, so we normally review like the protocol. We sit down with the sponsor and you know, kind of determine what we want to ask. So some surveys are shorter than others because sometimes they're sponsored. They just want to get to the point. They don't want all the fluff, right? Like they don't want extra stuff, which those are the ones I love because then sites answer them quicker because it takes less time for you to answer. Um, and then there's others that they want as much detail as possible. Sometimes it all depends if like the sponsor is like a biotech, if it's like a big farm, you know, if it's like a big pharma, sometimes like they already have so many trials. So it's kind of like easier if like it's a small or a company, they want as much information they can gather, right? So that determines kind of like how the questions are going to be made and what amount of questions are going to be sent. From there, it, I could just speak for, like, I'm going to speak for now. So then after that survey is populated or pre-populated, whatever, you know, platform you're going to be using, then you're going to have someone that's going to be actually reaching out to the site and making sure that they actually completed it. Some companies call it specialists and um, in my case, we're um, feasibility liaisons. That's who you're going to be receiving an email from, kind of like following up, right? Hey, please complete survey. So, you know, da 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 by date, you know, so and so. Then the feasibility lead again gets all the response, right? And then we collate it like into this big system, <laughs> you know, big, big spreadsheets and kind of like do like a point system. So it depends on like interest of, you know, if you're really interested, like motivation of the um, motivation of the PI, um, how many studies they've worked on, for example, also like, you know, in their experience. So there's like different brackets that you're going to kind of like you know, kind of give it like a percentage, depends on that bracket, right? So at the end of the day, you're gonna have like a big spreadsheet with like all the sites in order and you're gonna see, okay, you know, Ashley's site had a hundred, Monica's site had a 98, you know, Dan's site got an 80 and so forth. So you're gonna kind of look and see, okay, this one looks like it meets all the criteria that we're looking for. I think we should, you know, present this one to the sponsor and be like, hey, this is the one that we think. There's also sponsors that have like their preferred sites already. So it doesn't even matter what they respond. They don't mind. They just have some sort of relationship with that particular site. So they're just, they already know that they're going to be a site that's going to be part of the trial. Or some sites have like, you know, there's like key opinion leaders. So they're like, they probably were part of like the protocol creation. So we already know that they're going to be part of the, of the study. Another big thing is, okay, could you do like local RV, central RV? Those are like another ones, because again, the regulatory part, right? Like how quickly are they gonna be able to be up and running, which is now completely out of my scope. That's more of like study startup um, part. So more of like the CRAs when they do like the QVs, they do like the site initiation visits. So it's it's really, it's just a lot of different parts to, for you to actually get up and running and for you actually to be selected. Um, and then some sponsors are super quick to select, right? So that's like, that's what th those are the ones that we like because then the sites are happy, you get selected quick. And then some others take just a long time. They wait for the entire feasibility to be done for them to actually start selecting these sites. So then sometimes we have sites that get like antsy because they're like, oh, I completed the feasibility questionnaire two months ago and I haven't heard anything. And then we look 
like, okay, I'm sorry. It's really the sponsor has not made their decision to like, who's going to go into the study yet. So that's another tip that I would say, like, you should don't feel that you shouldn't follow up with a specialist or whoever actually reached out to you to know if you're part of the study or not. Sometimes we genuinely just don't know because it's just taking longer. And sometimes it's just so quick because the study, they want it to be up and running at some point of time that we actually let you know super quick and then you're gonna get your qualification visit done faster, et cetera. But really it's kind of like you look at the full questionnaire, kind of every single point of the questionnaire and the higher your points, well, the better the site in a way, right? So that's kind of how it, how it is. Um, and it's not, because I know someone kind of said, okay, is, is it a competition in a way? Um, and then that's where some sites, I think, get it twisted and they kind of like change their numbers or make things look just nicer, right? To hopefully be on like that top, top tier. But at the end of the day, if you're still not being truthful, which is like, I think that word I mentioned before, it's not gonna work. Because at the end of the day, you're gonna find out. Maybe you'll get lucky. I mean, I, I think there's been times when maybe you like, change the numbers and you're just super lucky and you actually get, you know, but sometimes you don't. Another thing too is like, is your site a site that's gonna need like um, patient recruitment, for example, like outside patients, or is it gonna be, you know, your own patient? So that's like another big thing too. Like, is your pool big enough to get this study up and running right away? Or are you gonna be able, or are you gonna have to need to use like external, you know, help? in order to get these sites, these patients like up and, you know, like in the study. And that again, depends on the indication because there's certain indications you're probably just not gonna have anybody in your database already. You're gonna have to do that. And sometimes in those studies, the sponsors already know. So they have that like separated, you know, budget for you to actually do, you know, advertisement in order to get, you know, your patients. But sites never, so sites never lie, Marlene, come on. So for those, I was for those, side, but I'm not going to say. <laughs> those paying attention, all I have to say is, ha ha ha, Dan site got an eighty. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Compared to Monica, she got a ninety-eight. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, I know. I caught that too. I'm a little salty. <laughs> hey, Marlene. <laughs> Mar <laughs> He's like, oh wait, wait. <laughs> now <laughs> marlene i was gonna ask you when there you know how sometimes like on clinicaltrials.gov the sites are blinded so it just says like for instance my site in yuma it mm -hmm. would just say investigative site in yuma mm -hmm. because the sponsor from my understanding the sponsors are very guarded over these sites but how can they be if most studies use a cro and then do you guys ever have like SOP you have to follow where let's say the sponsor brings you a study and says, hey, Marlene, like we don't care who you pick, but we want this site as well to be added. Are you now allowed because you're at the CRO and feel free to not answer if you don't want to. But if you're since you're at the CRO, are you allowed to use that site now for your other studies too at Park Cell? I mean, if it, there, it's basically if. And this, I don't do this, but I did it before in another CRO. Kind of like, are some sites are my are they're my sites or are they're the sponsor sites, right? So it's kind of like, is there already in my in my database? I could have used them for anything anyway before, right? So if it's like a brand new site, it's a little bit different, so it's a little bit more tricky because they were not part of my database. Mm -hmm. But like in our in these bigger CROs, we kind of have almost. Not, we don't have every site, obviously we don't, but it's easier for that site to probably be there. Maybe not under the same investigator, but maybe under under a different investigator. I see. Right? So that wouldn't be a problem because mm -hmm. it's already in my database. So I could have used it anyway, right? It's just the sponsor sometimes has Dr. So-and-so on their top of their list. And we just make sure that that one is approached or that one's part of like our outreach. Okay. I'm going to ask a question that I'm not, I'm not, I mean, again, if you, if you cannot answer it, it's perfectly fine. <laughs> Is there such a thing like a black book with the name of the sites that are, have been, I don't know, uh, listed as bad sites and then the sponsors shared that information? 
Um, for us, the main thing is compliance checks. So we have to do compliance checks. So like if your site has like any type of like issues, like recurring issues, you're going to be marked. Right. So I think that's the main thing is like if you are someone that keeps getting findings, like do I really want to use that site over and over again if you mm -hmm. keep up findings? So I think that's like the biggest thing. But I don't think I have like a, I mean, not in my, like a black list per se. <laughs> <laughs> but, that, really... that's kind of funny. <laughs> but it's it's more of like you know if you have and then and we could still use sites that have had like findings because sometimes they're like you know years past right but they still come up like all like when you do like these these searches it still comes back up but it you know and sometimes I don't know, not, not much here, but I've been in other CROs where they actually ask you that question, have you had a finding? And then they'll ask you to like, you know, give documentation. So I would always say if, if that's one of the CROs that's like sending you those questionnaires, do so and like just be as truthful as you can. Um, Cause things happen, right? Like, and, and, and if you're like a site that has like a lot of trials and you know, any little thing could slip and then you could kind of like make a mistake, but. No, I don't think we have like a blacklist. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if the, the sponsors do. But I, don't, I know, at least I don't. It's really going out. Yeah, you always wonder if they share information because sites sometimes do. I mean, sites sometimes do like a uh, networking between each other and say, oh, this sponsor is not that good. Sometimes, are you kidding? <laughs> Dr. Fox, this guy, Dr. Fox, I, I interviewed, <laughs> he's doing a credit score for sponsors. He's calling it something else. I oh, think wow. it's called a packed score. Chris, really? you're going to meet him on a Zoom in two weeks. But yeah, so it. it goes both ways. So uh, Monica asked a good uh, question. Uh, that I can segue into. Um, I actually had a call with one of our clients. Dan and I have clients throughout the country, about 80 sites in our network. And I often take calls on how important is data. So I always tell them, and you correct me if I'm wrong here, please. I always tell them most important is your recruitment numbers, but the recruitment numbers mean nothing if the data is not usable. However, if you had to choose okay data that's usable, but great recruitment numbers, that would be better than poor recruitment numbers and great data. So when you're saying great data is like in, in what sense though? Really, it's if you were to do um, uh, risk-based monitoring, you would never send any, any monitor to the site. They would need nothing, no hand-holding, right? So... Good, good data, great data, but they've enrolled two patients or 30 patients, but they need a lot of handholding to make, mm -hmm. to get the data up to par, which is preferred. I don't, I don't know how to answer that. I don't know what would be preferred. I mean, for me, like I want good, I want it all, right? Because <laughs> I mean, sure. I think that that's obviously everything, but like, I mean, I don't have anything to do with like monitoring side, right? So I, I wouldn't know answer that question that's like completely out of my scope but it, but for me obviously I know this the data if we at, at some point you could clean it up right yep. so I mean that's just just not my that's just me personally thinking because it has nothing to do with with what I do um, but you could at least at some point clean it up we need the numbers not so much recruiting but really enrolling to be honest right so because you could recruit and you could screen fill well, right you know, that's what I mean 30 yeah. patients enrolled yeah that is yeah. kind of weak, but it's usable. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. one or two patients, that is perfect. But what they only have. And then again, it depends on the, the study. If it's like a high enrolling study versus a study that you know is going to be difficult in getting. So those two are right. going to be like a super valuable, actually, right? But if it's a study that it's like, okay, like, or open enrollment, you already know this competitive enrollment. So you're like, let me put in as many as I can. Um, I just think it's good to have like a separate team in the sites that actually could review that, like, like that does like QCing. Um, just me as like being when I was like in, in a site level, because then you get back and you're like, oh, you had all these findings and then you have all these like red tapes on your binders. And then it's kind of like, oh, you just didn't have that. But it, in, in my opinion, obviously having the amount of sites, not the, the amount of um, patients 
it's 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 definitely a good thing. And I think the data, you know, litter by litter could be cleaned up. Maybe a monitor wouldn't say the same because that's what they're that's what they'll have to do. Sure, but, that's their nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and the other thing is also important to think about is the the screen failure rate, because if it's higher, then it's more difficult, obviously, or more challenging Mm -hmm. to recruit patients. And the sponsor knows exactly what the screen failure rate is if it's a study that already has been, you know, uh, on the uh, market for a while. Mm-hmm. We got a question from Jesse Molino Mello. What do you prefer to work at the site level, sponsor level, or CRO level, and why? Um, I I miss the site level just because I miss the patient interaction. So I because of my background that I used to be a PT, I don't remember half of the stuff that I went to school for, sadly. But um, I I I like that patient interaction and and working from home for a CRO. Like I'm literally at home, like you know, between my four four walls. So it's kind of like, it's hard after a while, it gets it gets difficult. If you're like an out, you know, I'm like a super extrovert. So it's kind of like, okay, it's it's hard. So and I, I miss like, okay, like meetings, like we're just going out for, for dinner, like in a team and stuff like that. Like, I can't do that here. Like all my team is all over, you know, the US. I mean, Brazil, you know, like I, I mean, I've met four of my direct reports just because I literally, was intentional to go visit them, but not because it was part of like our, you know, our budget to go get to see your your team. But I think that's the part that I that I that I miss or that I used to like being at the site level. Um, but the zero level, I I think I've found um, something that I'm very comfortable with and something that I'm passionate about. So I think that mixing that with like my my side of like you know, diversity and inclusion and all that, like, I think that it's kind of like a sweet spot for me now. Um, and the manager, you know, being a manager is topped it off just because I, I always had in my brain, I always said, I want to be a manager, like a line manager, because I want to be able to give them what I didn't receive when I was maybe in another position. So I'm hoping that I'm able to give my team what I've always wanted to receive. So I'm, I'm, and I'm just very happy right now. Like I'm super content right now. So um, but there's a good thing about every spot, you know, about everything. Yeah. Yeah, I think it depends on what you enjoy doing too. Yeah. <laughs> I, have I really think lot. that, also, sorry. Ahead. No, go ahead. I have to go say ahead. that I really think um, I was at a site level for a little bit. I'm in CRO now. And I really feel that when you come from site perspective, it, you really add that extra, you know, thing to your study team because you have that understanding. And even more so if it's from a diverse background, a rural area. Um, it, because like, for instance, like I'm in a, a rare study. And so, and we're dealing mainly with rural areas that um, are particular for diverse backgrounds. And so, you know, when you're dealing with certain situations or scenarios with sites with issues in enrollment and stuff like that, there's um, sometimes when individuals are from just CRO perspective, they really, you know, they get upset with the site or they're, you know, they get frustrated and it's like, yeah, but you know, you, you're not considering this, this is in this, right? So I think we need a lot more people that have had site perspective um, especially for like diverse backgrounds, that would that would be great. But that's awesome. Yeah. I'm I'm glad you found your your space. <laughs> that's it's just like the point. empathy, the, the empathy part, right? So I think, and and I and I and I I agree 100 percent because like I can relate to the sites too because I was there. I mean, I used to complete feasibility questionnaires at at one point of my life too, you know. So I know exactly what what is on the other side of the coin. So I think it, it does help having like you know full circle basically in a way it, it makes it it makes it a, it makes a difference really marlene you mentioned something that i get asked often um we have a students all over the world right sometimes um we have many imgs sometimes they live obviously in the united states sometimes they live overseas What's the possibility for them to work in a sponsor or in a CRO or a company in the United States being overseas? I mean, it's you have to find the global company. So like my company, for example, like I was saying, like one of my direct reports, she lives in Brazil, right? So she's 
and the, and I had another one that lived in Argentina. So there's definitely possibilities. They just have to have presence in that country. So for example, I can't have someone in my team from Panama because like Paracel doesn't have presence in Panama, right? So like that's the only tricky part. So it's really finding like what company has presence in what country and then trying to apply to whatever you know opportunity it is for that particular country because it was really hard for me to find someone in Argentina to be honest like for my like for that position like the person that I found it, they they eventually moved to Brazil <laughs> but um but it was really hard to find people you know in other countries that spoke English too right that's another thing you know like good enough English it doesn't have to be perfect because you're probably going to be speaking to them in, in Spanish or in that local language but it's really nice to know that there's a possibility. I have a friend right now in Mexico that um, he's actually Panamanian, but he lives in Mexico and he reached out to me. He's like, oh, how about like, what, what are your thoughts about like working for this, you know, particular CRO I used to work with? And I gave him my input and like, you know, he has a possibility of working in Mexico. And, I, and the other thing that I see is some, some, um, some individuals actually work in that particular country and eventually they actually get brought out, you know, brought over to the US. So I've seen that multiple times where they like fix your papers and all that. So I think it's really about education. Like at least, you know, a couple of that do, but I, I, in my case, like when I used, when I lived in Central America, I had no idea what clinical research was. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I would have never applied yeah. anything to work in clinical research because I didn't even know that existed. So I think they need, I, get, I mean, I'm just huge on like, okay, education, like how could we like get the word out? Like how could we let our people know that this exists? Because they could just benefit on so many different levels, getting the treatment and actually working here, you know, that's like, right. their knowledge for this. So, so next yeah. time you need somebody in South America, come to us. <laughs> well, not just South America and everywhere we have students from uh, Africa, we have students from uh, Australia, UK, India, uh, Eastern Europe, um, I mean, South America, and I don't know, you name it, <laughs> pretty much all over the world. So that's awesome. If you that's ever need good. somebody, we might be able to help you. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. That's really good. Do you well, want we're... That, so I'm good. I'm happy about that. <laughs> Well, you guys, we are hitting the time. Uh, this has been a very awesome discussion. I do apologize for me personally to coming in late, um, but it was a great discussion. And I know that, you know, the members that have been here today to watch have gotten a lot of information and all those that are going to be watching in the future through recording also. Uh, we did put uh, Marlene's information via LinkedIn. Please follow her, you know, contact her, connect, um, and those of you as well for uh, the future recordings that we'll be watching, uh, look her up on LinkedIn. And yeah, so thank you guys so much. It's been a really great session. Uh, I don't know, Monica, Dan, Chris, did you have anything before we wanted to? Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much, Marlene, for, no for your time, for answering all these questions. And thank you, everybody, for participating. Uh, we actually have one last question, if I can <laughs> mention it. Uh, it says, uh, what advice can you give to someone who is not sure which phase of studies they want to work in? But if this is too much, but uh, the pros and cons in working in each phase of a study. I, I think, I mean, uh, if I might answer this question, I think it's, it's um, working in phase one and then the other. Phase one is a totally different animal than the rest of the phases, but it also depends on the therapeutic area. Um, so uh, I think it's, it's, it's a great idea to work in, experience them all, so that way you have exactly an idea which part you like more and which phase you like more. Uh, phase one is a fast piece much more fast paced than the rest of the phases. And, yeah. and then phase two, three, and four are basically very similar in essence on how it works. So it's it's like two different options. Yeah, I agree. I, I think phase one is a lot more difficult. I, I think it's just, it's more, I feel it's so much more clinical. So I always, for some reason, I always like 
envision phase one and envision a nurse for some reason. I don't know why, but it's just so much more. It's, it's a little bit different. But again, it's just if he could be in a site that has exposure to all of them, I think that's the easiest way to kind of know, again, like to kind of like get your niche and like, OK, I like this or I like that. Um, you know, and maybe you like all of them, <laughs> but um, yeah. and 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 having experience in all of them, but also make you a generalist. Like we always keep on saying, or Dan keeps on saying all the time, generalist is is a, is a multi specialist, and you give yourself more options out there. Of course, I agree. All right, so uh, I think we don't have any more questions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marlene, always for your time. Oh, and welcome. and definitely, we're gonna bring you back. You have so much to offer. <laughs> uh, we can uh, we can hang out a lot in Zoom with you. <laughs> yeah. Come come to Orlando, and then we'll hang out. That should be nice. Oh, that'd, that'd be nice. nice. Yeah. <laughs> Next conference. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the weather's good here too, so that's always good. <laughs> I like Orlando. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank and you we'll guys. see you guys soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Take you. care, Thank everyone. You Bye.